Can growing a profitable tech business sit alongside impact or are they not compatible at all? We'll talk about that today on Culture Builder Live. Hey, I'm Chris Wink. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Technically, the news organization with the community of technologists and entrepreneurs. I'm coming to you live from Spark, Baltimore in beautiful Baltimore, Maryland. So forgive no mic, lesser audio quality, but it's for good reason. Um, we're talking about impact today and sitting there alongside tech business. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts about this. I'm super excited for this conversation. I'm joined by John Foster. He's the CEO of Fearless. It's a digital services firm. They build software with a soul. They're Baltimore-based, Baltimore founded. We've covered them for many years. John, thanks for being here. Awesome. Awesome. I, I love the intro graphic. Every time I see it, I get, I get boosted. I'm ready for the conversation. It's what, love it. it's what, and what, what better conversation to have than like how the heck can growing companies sit outside impact? It's a big one. Uh, we're going to try to do what we, see what we can do in 15 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. John, you and I talked a little bit a bit beforehand. I shared how for 15 years we at technically have been covering like basically how can tech companies matter to more people? Uh, there are a lot of feelings about this. One of the slogans of the last 10 years became this for profit for good. We saw this across our markets, companies saying, look, we think our digital services firm, our software firm, our startup, um, that we can grow and benefit the community we are in. Kind of curious, it's had a tough couple of years which you're going to talk about. Are you still an optimist on, on companies can grow profit and have impact? Is that still possible? Uh, definitely. And I think it has to be at the, the, the forefront. Um, it's got to be at the, the, the soul of the businesses in, in order for a lot of these businesses to, to succeed uh, in this, you know, in these upcoming years. Um, Simon Sinek, you know, um, has this thought in, in one of his books that like you can't you can't win at business. Right. Mm -hmm. you, you can only expand it. It can only it can only uh, be done in a way that helps other businesses grow. And I think. Um, you know, this idea that businesses need to think more about like the external world, right? The external forces, the external factors. Um, I think once again, it's got to be at the center of what they, what they do in order for them to, to frankly speaking, survive. Mm, there is a lot there. So let's start, let's, let's work with a, kind of an example. Can you give me a, a time you were fearless, you guys made a decision that impact was at its center or you went a different turn because impact was at least positive impact, I suppose, was at least thought of as much or alongside the bottom line? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's an interesting question. And I think, I think it's one of those things that probably has always been with the business from the get go. Right. So I, I think that we naturally have empathetic people inside the company. And so, um, you know, for folks to, to once again, the externalities, right. To think about themselves, um, or I think about others more than themselves, I think has naturally been, you know, embedded in, in the DNA of the company. Um, so I like two quick stories, right? One personal and then I answer your question on the business side. Um, I used to own some properties in, in, in Baltimore and, uh, you know, using the term landlord here, right? Um, <laughs> I struggled, I struggled um, with keeping tenants inside of the properties that I had, right? And my, you know, I was talking to my wife one day and, and she, she gave me some really sound advice. She's like, like, I think your problem is you're not, you're not being a human. And so that's, mm. that stuck with me, that sat with me. And so we actually ended up, you know, modifying the way that we thought about, you know, renting, renting, you know, th those properties. Right. And so it was more, more so about developing relationships with the tenants. It was more so about like getting to know their families, getting to know what they needed. And ultimately like how I, how I changed the way that I interacted with the tenants ended up helping the business in the long run. They stayed longer. They, they were more engaged when problems came up, right? Like I got it, I got, got out in front of them um, much earlier, right? And so I think this idea of like, once again, just like bringing the humanistic side uh, into my life, into the business is something that I think resonated uh, with me when it came to Fearless. And so, you know, when I talk, if I give you like a practical example about, you know, what happened at, yeah. at this, um, we, we were doing, we, we were, and we still are doing some work um, the, uh, a, a state, I can't name the state, um, cause they're still doing, still doing some of the work. Fair. Um, and, and the state is trying to increase the number of, of businesses, uh, in the state. Right. So we created like a, like a, like a, a landing page. Um, we, we created some services to allow this business to start up like very seamlessly. Right. And, uh, and so I, I went and I sat down with like, 
the head of the project. And I said, hey, this is great. I love some feedback about, about how we're performing on the project. And through that conversation, right, like I started, it's like something clicked in me. I said, let me ask some whys. Like, why does this project matter to you, right? And, and through a series of, you know, once, once again, if you do the five whys, right, really what the state was interested in doing is uh, we, like they could see pockets of, of uh, business deserts, right? And they could see pockets of business deserts in particular in minority communities. And they were really uh, uh, hell bent on trying to figure out why that was happening and what they could do to solve that problem. Now, when we started the project, they never asked that, like th that never was a main requirement. So it took some time for us to understand and get at that why. And I think that is that actual why that really is the, the, the resonating and driving factor for that project. And ultimately why I think it's successful because now, now we're building services in a way that is more open-ended, more inclusive, you know, so on and so forth. And so once again, I, I think I tell the story because getting at that why, right, I think uh, uh, unlocked the idea of what is the real impact that the, that that project is trying to get at. And then if you think about that project in, in, in multitude across Fearless, that's ultimately how, how we view impact in line in our business. Man, I'm excited about a lot of what you're getting at. I mean, someone would come as, come over and push you and say, all right, well, a line of fearless's business is, is governments, which, which obviously by definition have a different constituent base. They, government, you know, through taxing authority, um, I don't want to bring up my old political science background, but, you know, the authority of the state means it has a different relationship with its, its customers, its clients. So let's, let's go to this like big wide societal conversation that accelerated the last few years. I, I feel like my 15 years of business and economics reporting, it's like one of the biggest questions of our society of the moment. We have that big, iconic, much discussed essay from influential economist Milton Friedman 50 plus years ago at this point on maximizing shareholder value, which became a, you know, a mantra of the 80s, the Reagan revolution. Um, a lot has matured since then. And I think I've never met a mainstream economist that doesn't feel like there's a degree of state intervention where markets create failure. That, I, don't, I don't think that's, there's a mainstream opinion on that. I'm sure someone in the comments might be yelling at me, but, but <laughs> overall that, that has become pretty mainstream. But we still have this tension. And a few years ago, business roundtable, CEO um, letter, famous of publicly traded companies, writes about stakeholder capitalism to counter shareholder capitalism. The idea that there is array array of stakeholders we have to keep into account. Your employees, your community, where you are geographically. There's a lot of nuance in this debate, but I, I feel like there's a kind of tension that comes down to folks who say, caring about profit is just about focus. If you think doing some behaviors are required to maintain a happy and loyal, loyal, loyal employee or customer base, that might have positive externalities, I mean, it's still you focusing on the idea of building the healthiest business you can. And there are others who kind of feel like it's impossible to only stay too linear on profit. It's impossible for you to weigh in on, on this like doctoral dissertation that's sitting in front of us. But I guess I'm kind of curious how much at Fearless are you guys weighing um, doing good without losing focus on building and maintaining the healthiest business you can? Yeah, it, it's a good question. I um, yeah. A, a, e even as you were, you know, asking the question, I, I was trying to be even more reflective, right? And you know, I told you before we started that, like, I don't have all the answers, right? But and and I wish that we were just a little bit um, less certain about our our positions in life as people, because I think that uh, that actually would unlock a lot of you know problems that we you know exist in society. But I, I think um. Having multiple focuses, I, I think is, and I didn't say this earlier, and, I, and it's just coming to me. I think it's humanistic, right? Like mm -hmm. just think about your life, right? How hard is it to have a singular focus because you have so many different cares, right? You have so many different needs. You have so, so many different responsibilities. So to, to think that like a, a business, um, which is simply just a, a collection of people, can have can have just a singular focus. I I, I just don't think that that is a I, I I don't think I believe in that in that construct. Right now, you can have and through you know proper order, proper structure, you can have prioritization of those things. Right, but um, you know 
my kid over here needs something and my kid over here needs something, right? Like I, I got to balance both those things, right? And, and I just, I don't necessarily know if I believe um, in, in a singular, in a singular construct, singular focus. Um, the, the other thing I would say too, along those lines is uh, I think, and you're starting to see it more and more. And I think it's, it's the thing that's probably not said often when, when you know, economists and pundits and talking heads are on, on, on TV talking is um, I think that, that we're slowly approaching the maximum of maximizing shareholder value, mm. right? At, at some point, uh, there's got to be a cap to this, right? And, and you can see it somewhat in the wild swings in the stock market. You could see it um, in, in the, the constant, um, you know, contractions of some, some of these businesses uh, that's happening today um, because th they're running out of ways <laughs> to maximize value. And I think what, what is required is those businesses need to look at their business models in a way where it's not just about how do I get to, you know, increasing that income, but ultimately like what are the other externalities in life that can maybe force, maybe create the conditions for new customers to come on board, right? So you got to think in different ways. And I think when you think in, 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 that, in that growth mindset kind of construct, I think it'll open the doors for those, for those businesses to continue to, to grow, um, just not necessarily strictly, you know, be, being beholden to that, that bottom line. I, man, I, I, keep, I keep hearing inside of what you're saying a question of timeline. And it, I might be overly simplistic here, but some of what you're saying is like, look, if, if I can, um, uh, you know, run a, a spammy marketing campaign to convert customers that might churn out later, that might be seen as having negative impact. And maybe it has, it might boost a, a profit and loss statement for this quarter, but you'd argue like, oh, the long-term impacts on the brand would have more value. And so, you know, honesty and integrity has, has greater long-term value. There's a lot of those examples that I think anyone would sit with and say like, oh, I get, I see that. Um, I mean, I keep coming back to like, I wonder, it, it may just be an impossible question, but do you have like that hardest moment? Cause I gotta feel like, let me, this is a sideways example, but this is what's in my head right now. Um, we have a very hard global conversation on climate change happening when it, when it, run, it runs aground of anti-poverty efforts. And it's like a, a very thoughtful conversation. I've had a bunch of conversations with folks who talk about, um, do you care about the immediate human suffering of someone in deep poverty right now? Or do you care about green finance and climate change in the future? And, and the easiest answer is, look, we can find ways that can do both. And that's true. But there's lots of times where it just can't. And you're, you, as a society, are making a choice. Do we need that? dollar to go toward green infrastructure, you know, greater long-term impact or the immediate need of our concern. And I think there's a parallel for what we're talking about with, for all of the tech businesses we cover at Technically for Fearless, where I know at some point you, you get put in this tough situation somewhere where it is like, man, this would help someone right now, but we want to, you know, you're not given all of Fearless's profits to buy malaria nets, right? Like you, you at some point are saying we have to balance business goods. I guess I'm just wondering, what is the actual conversation you guys have about how you balance doing the most good with growing a company that has shareholder value? Yeah. How messy is that? <laughs> it's, it's, um, it certainly is not easy. I, I think it is. And what people don't understand is that it, it is very, very much like a, um, a tactile activity on, on the daily, um, I think it requires um, empathy, right, at all levels, right? I think it requires uh, us to teach empathy to, to, to folks. I think it requires us to, to teach um, our employees how to have constructive conversations, right? Mm. Um, I, I, and so, you know, I'm trying to come up with, with like one example because that's what you're trying to like get me to focus. Yeah. Um, but I, but I, I think that in my head right now, I, I could just point to like your question. It, it is, it is a difficult thing. Right. And, and um, yeah. Let me, cause I'm going to lose you here in a minute. Another way to approach it that you and I talked about briefly before weighing value and impact. A lot of folks, when I have this conversation, will push on like, look, business, businesses have to create value for customers, for constituents, whatever. And, and impact is a just a mushier word than value. So why don't we just talk about value? And I'm wondering why, like, why is impact the word that, that you use, if it is the word that you use over something like value? 
Yeah, I, I think, and I, I think I have the 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 you know some privilege to to think in in this way in our business, and maybe not every business has this has this opportunity, but um, you know, value is about you know getting to some to to some outcomes, right? Um, mostly mostly positive, right? Um, the thing that I'm interested in when it comes to the idea of impact is that impact can be um, can, can be negative. You, you can do things that are that are detrimental to other people, right? And so, um, what I'm interested mm. in is, is thinking about impact from a from a longitudinal standpoint, right? So, it, it like if we do X, right? What result happens today? Why? But more importantly, how do we measure how that thing that we did uh, is is measured? in five, 10, 15, 20 years from now, right? So it is, it is once again, it just to like round out the thought, right? That's what most organizations cannot do because they have to maximize share, shareholder value today. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying we've created a construct inside the business that allows us to say, no, 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 no. We recognize that we have to be profitable today, but there are other ways in which we have to measure over the long run, right? And if we hold those things true, that should be impacting the business decisions of today. Mm. I, I'm going to lose you here and I'll ask you a final question on the way out, but that idea of, of timeline might be your, your lasting point. And so maybe you've even set up your answer to, to the final question I have for you, which is going to be, you know, what are you saying to other tech business leaders from the, you know, uh, I have a VC back company, a lot of pressure to just grow and that's all I'm doing. Or, you know, I, I bootstrapped the company and I'm professional services and maybe I'm building some software. And so I have a little bit more ownership of where I can go. Or the you know marketing agency that that does a little bit of tech adjacent work. Those different CEOs, those different lead leaders, if they came to you and said, "John, how do I balance impact with my priorities of growing the healthiest business?" What's your advice to them? Yeah, I I talk to many businesses about this exact thing, and for me, it always is simply just starting with your your why, right? Mm. Be super clear about your why. Be super clear about, or you should be starting to get clear about how you measure towards that why, right? Because if you hold that true, right, you'll know, you'll, you'll, you'll know, you'll feel it, you'll see it, people will tell you when when you're when you start to show up in a very inauthentic way. Mm. Right. And and I think as, as a business owner, once again, trying to maximize the, the value of your company is one thing, but I think holding true to who you are as a person probably is this the singular most important thing that most business owners don't talk about mm. that they do care about. So John. Can't do better than that to go out. Uh, John Foster, CEO of Fearless Digital Services Agency, headquartered, founded. Um, they love Baltimore, but they do work around the country. John, thank you so much for your time. This is awesome. Thanks. Do it again. Appreciate it. Yeah, indeed. Uh, John, thanks so much. Thanks, everyone, for listening. See you next time. Bye. Bye.